I want to thank my friend on Instagram, Bifurcat, that is like the word bifurcate without the E, for recommending today's book for me, the Poena Domini by Demetrius Leokos in this beautiful slipcase edition from Shoestring Press. I really appreciate it. The light outside cutting the evening to pieces. Harsh evenings that fall among strangers. The story shatters within you. Pieces. Fading away in the ebb of this time. The one dissolving into the other before you manage to sleep. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf today. I'm talking about Demetrius Leokos and his Poena Domni trilogy. This is three books in order. Uh, it is Z213, Exit, With the People from the Bridge, and The First Death. This is really interesting for me because I think the most contemporary or most recent Greek literature that I've read uh, would probably have to be Kavafi, the Greek poet, uh, and even that's more, you know, uh, earlier and mid 20th century. But before that, as far as Greek literature, for me, it's all ancient Greece, of course, Homer and the tragedians, Sophocles, Aeschylus. This is not only contemporary Greek literature, but it's very avant-garde very postmodern Greek literature. It sort of reminded me of reading Carol Masso, especially in her book, Ava. It reminded me of reading the flash fiction of Diane Williams, where there's this very fragmentary nature. And it also reminded me a lot of reading Jason Schwartz in uh, John the Posthumous. And I have a video on, on that book from uh, last year or the year before, I believe. But it's very sort of fragmentary. Again, you can tell that Leokos is very much uh, a poet. He has a poet's sensibility. But he has said in interviews that only the final volume, The First Death, is considered poetry and it is it's in uh it's 14 different sections and they're each poems now what's interesting about it is that the third installment of the trilogy the first death is mentioned in the opening uh installment of the trilogy z213 exit and if i'm understanding things correctly z213 seems to be our narrator's number or identification that he's been given he seems to be uh, a, an escapee of some kind of concentration camp, some kind of uh, imprisonment. And he cites The First Death as a book that he has with him. He's got a Bible, albeit a very interesting Bible, where lots of words are smudged around and pages are inserted with these kind of codes. In any case, he's got the first death with him. And so it's cited in the first volume and then we get to read it as the final volume. So I had to be careful not to get, come into the final volume thinking that it's the same narrator, this uh, Z213. But sort of the progression here is that in the in the first installment, like I said, we've got this escapee. He digs his way, claws his way through these tunnels. He's got all these, uh, it's, it's sort of a, it seems like it takes place in a very post-apocalyptic world. Lots of just mud and filth and fires burning and lots of rain and marginalized figures, people trying to survive. Basically, I kind of I kept thinking of Cormac McCarthy's The Road uh, as I read it, though. It's not, nothing quite like that. Just the setting and the mood and atmosphere. Uh, anyhow, he makes his way out and he ends up in this house with this man and this woman. There are all kinds of different encounters that take place thereafter. Then we move into with the uh, people from the bridge. This is the uh, second installment. And this one reads 
Uh, it harkens back to Greek tragedy. It even includes a chorus, which was something that was very much created by the Greeks. Um, so it's really neat to see here in the 21st century that, that connection, that conversation uh, and, and, and ingenuity still in continuation. And then finally, with the last volume, like I said, we get the uh, poems in this book that the narrator of the first volume is carrying around with him. It's extremely inventive, uh, unique prose. As you read it, um, you know, words are omitted altogether. Expected syntax and punctuation uh, is defenestrated. Words that shouldn't be opposite one another are included. So you get these effects right off the bat because at the very start of the very first volume, it starts off in medias race, not only in the middle of action that's going on, but also sort of in the middle of what should be a full sentence. So the very first sentence, it's indented almost all the way to the right, and it starts with these names, and that's how they found me. That's the first sentence, and these uh, is lowercase. So it's almost like the very first uh, section of the entire opening sentence is cut out. And the typography is toyed with in endlessly to tease out these this unique style and this unique reading experience because we've got lighter colored text, which is where the character is reading these interspersions of the Bible um, and our uh, translator from the Greek has used the King James Version, and we get these interspersions of, of a text from other people, uh, and then the narrator. And Leokos toys with perspective, and even the, uh, the switch back between first-person singular and first-person plural to go from I to we uh, back and forth, which gives this really jarring effect because there's a lot about, there's a lot of questioning uh, underneath the text about identity. In fact, one of the first things that I started to notice as I was reading through these volumes is that proper names are omitted altogether. There's no proper names for people, places, or things. So you don't get any first and last names. You don't get any place names except for one moment. On the very last page of the second volume, we get this little paragraph that says, the partially decomposed head of a woman stolen from a crypt at Hollywood Memorial Park Cemetery early Sunday was found in the street next up to a man who was subsequently arrested, Los Angeles police said. And I read uh, an interview with Demetrius Leokos on the Los Angeles Review of Books, where he had just done a tour, a book signing tour and a reading, and he was there in LA and everyone was warning him against going into Skid Row. And he says, so naturally, because so many people told me not to, I did it. And you can see this fashion, fascination with uh, marginalized people. Uh, we know that Skid Row is this terrible sort of dumping grounds for not only inmates, and drug addicts, but also for the mentally ill. We know that there have been moments over the years, times over the years, when mental institutions have just kind of dumped patients there. And there's a saying that if you don't uh, get out of Skid Row within three days, you'll be a resident for life. You can see that there is a lot of fascination there. And a lot of this comes into play throughout this trilogy. It's not overt. Everything while reading this is oblique. You have to kind of look at it sideways. But there are images in there such as uh, a wheelchair that's used very significantly uh, to, to give this intimation of people dealing with not only existential pain, but also physical pain and mental pain. There's also a wealth of allusion. This, these texts were written and revised over a period of 30 years. So in total, as you can see, they're very slim volumes. And in fact, they're even slimmer than they appear um, because there's only text on one facing page all the way through. So the left-hand page is blank all the way through every volume. So altogether, it's only like 100 pages of text. Nonetheless, it's given to us in this, these beautiful volumes with this nice, hard slipcase from Shoestring Press. But it's very tightly coupled with analytic philosophy 
and with ancient Greek texts, especially the Odyssey, some of these will be pretty overt. Uh, however, the philosophical connections are a little more buried. There's a lot of epistemological uh, yearning and questioning. There's a lot that goes with empiricist thought, such as John Locke. But then, like I said, there's a lot of biblical allusion, and some of it is rather overt, such as uh, the moment that the demon legion is being cast out. But there are some that are a little more subtle. And then once you get to them, if you can pick out the context and the allusion, it'll really change uh, the way that you see everything you've just read. So you've been with this uh, narrator through the first volume and through almost all of the second volume, the one whose number seems to be Z213. And then you get to this moment. It says, he puts the book aside, comes to us and shares out his papers. Whoever wants takes one. My neighbor leaves them and goes off and two more likewise. Why do I recall I took one, meaning one of the books, and put it in my mouth? Paper like honey, sweet. And at first you're like, Okay, bibliophagia, we've seen this before, we've heard of it, but paper like honey, sweet, stood out to me uh, because I recalled that from the Bible. And in fact, it comes from Revelation 10 verses 8 through 11, and a voice commands John the Revelator to take the scroll from the mighty angel and eat it. And when he does, he in fact says that the pages are sweet to his taste like honey. So now that just shines a light backwards on all of our readings so far. And we're like, wait a second. So this is, this figure is like John the Revelator who wrote Revelation while in exile on the Greek island of Patmos. Each volume gets progressively more poetic. Again, Demetrius Leokos himself says he only sees the final volume as poetry proper, but it gets, you know, this is when it gets extremely visionary, less narratively driven. It opens up with such great lines as moon silent as pain in the depth of the mind. Silent as pain in the depth of the mind. Think on that for a bit. And the moist stings of the scorpions show the way and the mind a map dipped in wine and the soul within its muzzle suckling the further horizon of pain. And we find out early on that the narrator is suffering from some physical pain, and most characters are. And as we've seen, as I've talked about with Proust, most pains we can sort of move past and we can, you know, utilize the mantra mind over matter. But physical pain, you can't help but submit to it. It silences you. There's this ontological questioning as well as epistemological, the question of are we? How can we be? You know, it engages with Cartesian dualism. And the narrator in the first volume at one moment says, anyway, if I can think of myself right here, there ought to be something else outside, some place else. Now, if this outside is part of my mind, my mind then is not made of one single piece. It isn't one fold. There's here and there's there, outside and inside. That is to say, in a way, there is something in it that is outside of myself. And this one, you know, I had to sort of think on this for a little bit and what exactly he's saying. But it's, again, this question of solipsism uh, versus the transcendental idealist philosophies that there is a real reality that transcends our perception. I would say that overall, the prevailing theme of this trilogy is escape, getting from confinement to freedom. If you're interested in what's going on in contemporary European fiction, I would highly recommend the Poena Domni trilogy by Demetrius Leokos. This is basically postmodern poetics from contemporary Greece.